one of the roles of any um, fellowship is to reach out to people. The, any Christian group exists not just to meet in the eternal needs, but in order to reach out. Because the Great Commission is for everybody as an individual and as a group. So whether you're a Christian union, one of your big responsibilities will be outreach. If you're in a school, anybody who does not get to become a Christian in the whole school, God will hold you accountable. Not because the, you, you have the power to save, no. Yours is only proclamation, loving people into the kingdom, making friends with them. But why is, so, is it so important to talk to everybody? That it includes people that are already baptized, people that are confirmed, people that are, whose parents are Christians, and they even attend the Christian Union, but they are not born again. Maybe you need to think clearly and help everybody in the fellowship to understand that when, he, when you become a Christian, you become a theologian. Theos for God, logia for utterances. You, you therefore become a theologian means you, you become a student of God's word, of God's utterances. And therefore, when you talk about theology, you're talking about what God has said. You're talking about what practices God has sanctioned. And it needs to be understood that the, one of the responsibilities of the fellowship is to ensure that every born-again believer understands what salvation is and why he needs to attract others to this salvation. You know, when you go to study like those who go to Bible schools, they, they, there are many things they do, like they do what I hear some people call them biblical studies. And here you are talking about examination and interpretation of theological texts. They are taught how to, to interpret. That is a new text or principles of biblical interpretation. And so biblical studies is something that every Christian union should be teaching people. It's important to share with the people, how do you know? How do you know how to interpret the Bible? The Old Testament, the New Testament, the poetry books, the, 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 the narrative books. How do you know? I think it should be important that every Christian union has at least once a year a discussion on how to interpret the Bible. It's also important for you to share a bit of, which is again taught in Bible school, about um, practical theology. Here you are talking about, um, uh, the, 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 you, are talk, you are talking, you are talking about um, the theology itself and how it is practiced. You could even talk about how do I apply the Bible text to the issues I learn in my culture or in my tradition. All those are, will be practical theology, and it means that the Christian Union needs to help the students of that area to, still, to know what the Bible says as opposed to what their tribe, their culture, actually says. And that will be something that will be important for people who are patrons of CU to assist the Christian Union to get to know practical theology. But of course, there's another one they normally call systematic theology. Here, the Christian union member needs to understand the core doctrines of the Christian faith, the core beliefs of the Christian faith. And uh, it will be important that, that somewhere between the four years somebody is in a Christian union, they actually get to, to do this. You know, you have to, in systematic theology, you go through all the 66 books of the Bible and pull out together the various pieces on each item. Because if you talk about the doctrine of salvation, it will be found in the Old and the New Testament. So you now are not reading 
you are not following a text, like the biblical text, like that. You are now passing through the whole Bible to see what the totality of teaching on that particular topic. Because, and that's why they are calling systematic theology, because you now you have systematized it into a topic and you are going through the whole scriptures. And that will be something that will be important for you to train every student to understand. But in, all, in addition to all this, it will be important to encourage the students to read biographies, you know, like the heroes of the faith. That will help them to understand church history and how God has used students, used people to accomplish his purposes in history. And that will make them come to where they know God, in their own generation, God would also want to use them. Um, how in history we are learning, this is what the Bible says, but how has that interacted with individuals and nations where those individuals lived? And how have the various historical events affected our interpretation of the scriptures? Has our interpretation changed over time? Was there a time when there were no Pentecostals? When did Pentecostalism come? You know, this will help you to study theology in the various contexts that we find in history. So church history is something that will be important once in a while to see how you can help your, your, your student. Because if you are going to mature, all those things, the biblical studies, the systematic theology, the practical theology, will need to be known by every Christian. And, uh, and it will be important that these things you are talking about are also true of every pastor. If you are really a pastor discipling your church, I think it will be important these things are not just for Bible school. They are for the individuals. You don't you have to use those titles and don't use, don't use Greek and Hebrew. Just go ahead and share with your people. That will leave them people that are knowledgeable, able to defend their faith, and that will be something very, very useful. You know, if you are doing that, you can, you, you end up with a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of names for the various topics you, that this Christian Union in four years will have covered. You know, you can talk about, you can give somebody a, a, a topic like an introduction to the Bible, an introduction issues. If you like big ones, you talk about prolegomena, you know, but that's just a big word for introduction. You can also put topics that help you to understand man, because it's very important in understanding that, that you are a mature person. It will be important that there are several Bible studies you have done on man, the fall of man. Who is man? Because it's when you understand yourself, you are able to know how to approach people when you want to, out re to reach out for them for the kingdom of God. But also important for you to understand yourself. Uh, and it will be pretty important that um, you are actually involved in that study of man. Who is man? How does he organize? How does the word the Bible say about it? I think that, that that's what they normally call anthropology. Which, of course, anthropology are not necessarily Christians. Anthropology is not necessarily Christians. But the Bible itself tells us about the story of man in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. What is the, where did we come from? How are we organized? I think that will be quite important. I think another, another area that, that the Christian Union needs to cover is, or any fellowship needs to cover, is the study of sin. If you really are going to reach out to people, you need to understand what is sin. What does the Bible say about sin? And that will be quite a, quite an issue. Of course, if you like a big word, it's called hama, hama theology, you know. But basically, we are just talking about what is sin because the Bible talks about sin. And in a systematic theology, you will go through the Old and New Testament to see what the Bible says about sin, beginning from Genesis chapter three, where the fall of man is well indicated. And then finally, you 
now come to the topic itself that of our interest, study of salvation. Um, you want witness to people, understand what God says about the lostness of man and how God recovered him. You can find the, you can find the issue covered in Genesis chapter 4, but you even can find it in Revelation chapter 22. And it's important to understand the whole issue about salvation. Because there are some people who say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not saved. No, let the students understand what the Bible says about salvation. If you like a big word, that's what they call in theology, soteriology. It's just a big word for the fact that you are, you are looking at the study of salvation. But beyond that, in systematic theology, you can bring topics that, for students to, 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 be, to be better where you study what the church is. Remember, the fellowship, this Christian Union fellowship, has to understand the meaning of church, study of the church. Keep helping students to understand that Christian Union is not really specifically speaking a church. It is um, it's a fellowship of people from various churches. But it's, so that's why we don't use the term church when you're talking about the Christian Union. We talk about the fellowship. So that you're encouraging people to belong to their churches. So that because in school they are there for a few weeks, then they go back for holidays. And after four years, they go back to church. You need to show them the importance of the church. And that it's the responsibility of a Christian union to help people to value the church. So I think it would be good to call somebody to just talk about the, the study of the church. What does the Bible say about the church systematically? If you like a big word, ecclesiology. And I think it would be important for a student to understand what the church is. And um, you also, I think you would be helped if you understood the central figure of the Bible is Christ himself. And you find information him predicted in the Old Testament, him fulfilled in the Gospels, him predicted in the book of Revelation. And it's important to have, to have a study of who Christ is. Again, if you like a big word, Christology. But if that would be a topic that you could easily uh, bring somebody to, to talk about. Obviously, you need to bring somebody who understands theology, but knows it well enough to put it simply. It's a pity when some people claim to know, because he has a PhD in theology, but he's speaking in Greek and Hebrew and not communicate to the Form 1. The way you can prove you really know something is your ability to bring it to the level of anybody. You can say it in a simple form. And that's what you have to do with the Christology so that the student can understand who Christ is and what he does with the sin. But of course, it will be important also to show the student to understand the place of the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, of the Godhead the study of the Holy Spirit and the whole issue about Pentecostalism and the gift of the Spirit. These are important that before a student has finished from four, it will be important that the, that has been dealt with. I like if you like a big word for it is pneumatology. But all we are talking about is who is the Holy Spirit? How does he play his role in salvation in, in man? But of course, a few more topics that uh, will be good for you to share with your students will be the issue of angels. They are mentioned in very, various places. Are we to expect angels to be around our classroom? Who are angels? What does the Bible say about it? Billy Graham wrote us a book on it. I think it will be important that you, you have somebody at least within the four-year period, somebody should have had a study of angels. If you like a, a, a big word, is in geology. But also, you could talk about the study of the end times. Certainly, you shouldn't leave your student, if you are the organizer, if you are in charge, chairman of the CEO, or you are CEO patron, without talking to them about the end times. When is Jesus coming? How is Jesus coming? What are we to do to prepare? If you like a big word, eschatology. These are issues. All these are mentioning so that anybody who is running a Christian union will understand 
why it is important to understand that. Because with that kind of background, when you know, now go to witness to somebody about salvation, what we call soteriology, I think it, it will be easier to explain. But let me say a few more things about this issue of salvation. You need to help the student to understand the importance of understanding what salvation is. You, you need to understand the whole issue about atonement. The, and I think that will be quite an important, an important, an important issue. You know, when you talk about uh, salvation, there are three things that have happened when you say, I am saved. You are actually saying a um, lot of things in a, in a very short time or with a one word. You know, you need to understand the, in the process of talking about salvation, the importance of eternity. The fact that we are, we don't, even if, when we die, we live on. And uh, to understand what a privilege it is to know God, because if you know him, then you live with him in heaven. And it's important to, uh, to, to, be, to be clear about that. So when you are going to witness to somebody, I think it will be important for you to have understood that there are three activities that are happening. You need to understand that there is sin, Adam's sin, to all humanity, as per Romans 5.12. So you need to understand that he, even before he has done anything, he is involved in Adam's sin. So, with Adam's sin, then ends up to be our sin. Somebody in theology has called it transfers. So he, the, 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 the new person you are witnessing to needs to understand there is a sin he has just because he is a, he's, he's the, he's a human being. He was born in, uh, somewhere along the lineage of Adam who fell into sin. But the second activity that he needs to understand is that when Christ came, this Adam's sin that was in humanity, he said it is finished to mean the sin of the world had now become our sin. Humanity's sin was now on Christ. According to 2 Corinthians 5.21, he became sin for us. So that means the person needs to understand, just like it sounds so oh, helpless, how can I be sinful even by the time I'm born? To remind him, Christ has already sorted that out. Because now, your sin can be put by faith Onto the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, if that happens, when humanity's sin is put on Christ, it means then that that, the, that that transfer, Christ's righteousness, because he's the one who is righteous, is transferred to us as believers. So despite our sinfulness, we are seen by God the Father as holy. Um, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. So, what we are then saying is that when you come to Christ, there is redemption. We are redeemed, paid for. We earlier belonged to the devil because we fell, but we are now paid for. Romans 3.24 The ransom was paid by Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. Um, and that once it's paid, if you accept that payment process, God no longer looks at you as guilty. And in the process, you experience not just redemption when you get saved, you also re experience reconciliation. According to Romans 5.10, you are now reconciled with the Father. You no longer, God is, you are no longer, uh, you are no longer hostile to God. God is not hostile to you. You are now friends. You can go to God saying, Abba, Father, and pray to him. That means to be actually born, born again. You are redeemed. You are reconciled with God the Father. But there are some other big words that are used. One of them uses expiation. This is the removal of sins, eternal penalty. Micah 7, 19 talks about it. Psalms 103, verse 11 and 12. Hebrews 10, 17. 
Psalms 32, the temporal consequences of, of, of sin may still be with you, but in expiation, he has removed the sin eternal penalty. Then the other word they use is propitiation. And you can see that in the first letter of John chapter 2, verse 2. Satisfaction of divine wrath. Propitiation means is you are paid for. He is no longer, God is no longer unhappy with you. God's wrath against sin has been satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And in the process, we now understand imputation. Philippians 3, 9. Not if having a righteousness of our own, Paul says, but through faith in Christ. We are now righteous. But righteousness is not resident in us at all. So what are we really saying? We are saying, we are saying several things. That salvation is three things in one. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. In other words, um, we in the in the past tense, once you have repented your sins, you are justified. History. God looks at you as if you have never sinned, although you know you have sinned. But Christ has paid for it. So you are justified, past tense. But there's another one, present continuous, and that is sanctification. Sanctification means despite the fact that your sins have been you have been justified. There is a process that continues on earth of sanctification. But one day, we will get experience glorification, which is not to happen. We are not yet glorified. So when you say, I'm saved, part of it you have experienced. There is a part you are yet to experience. There is a part you are experiencing on a daily basis. So what we then are saying when we say we are saved, we are saved from sins, Justification means penalty. We are saved from sin's penalty. That means we will not pay for our sin because Christ has paid for it. So we have been saved from sin's penalty. Hey, but when you say you are saved, you are saying also you have been saved from the power of sin. That means you will still be tempted even after you are justified, but God will give you power to overcome. Sanctification is a present continuous thing. Yes, and you will not stop being tempted even after you are saved. But because you are sanctified, you are being sanctified present continuous, it means he will give you victory over sin continuously. But one day, we are waiting when we will be saved from the presence of sin, which is what is glorification. That means there will be no sin, you will not be temptable, there is no possibility of you sinning. That's a future thing. So you are saved from sin's penalty in justification, sin's power uh, in sanctification, so that you are able to overcome sin, sin's presence when we, re we reach heaven. If you want to study sanctification, read Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, also Titus 3, verse 5. You will understand from that passage, justification requires that you believe we are saved by grace through faith. And you need to help the non-Christian to understand that all he needs to do to be justified, accept his sinfulness, believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross, and you'll be justified. What about sanctification? In Philippians 2 verse 12, it means that on a daily basis, appropriate God's commands in other words, you follow God. You know, and I've heard the song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Sanctification requires daily obedience as Holy Spirit to bring conviction. But to experience glorification, you have to be out of this life, either by dying or Jesus coming, what we call the rapture. So, this non-believer you are going to witness to must be helped to move, to become uh, a, believer, a believer in Jesus Christ. So he is justified. But uh, he is still an infant. If he is going to grow, 
he has to be helped. And that's why when a, somebody becomes a Christian, he has to be discipled so that he can become a spiritual believer. If he is not discipled, he will very easily become a carnal believer. That means he's a struggler with his sin. So, the whole issue as we go towards finishing is when we go to people to talk to them about salvation, we are talking about atonement. It's the only means for us to get saved, atonement. You know, when we say that, it's what Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 to 6 is saying, in atonement, Christ took our sin, Christ bore our suffering, Christ pierced, was pierced for our transgression, Christ was crushed for our iniquities, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's how he atoned for us. Christ did satisfied God's holiness that demands sin to be punished. Because Christ was holy, his blood was righteous. If, not, if you are sinful and you die, you are dying also of your own sin. But Christ was holy. He bore the wrath of God on my behalf. You know, you, if you go to Leviticus chapter 16, you will see the day of atonement. But please understand that salvation is free for me, but it was expensive for Jesus Christ. That blood, the blood of Jesus in Acts 20, 28, the church of God which is, the, is purchased with the blood is what he is talking about. It purchases. The church will not be existing without it. Romans 5, 8. Since we have been justified by his blood, Hebrews 9, 22, the law requires that for without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. That's why the blood is the center of, and the cross is the center of Christianity. And the person you are witnessing to needs to be told that. And Hebrews 9, 12, he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So there is no other sacrifice. No traditional sacrifice are necessary because Christ paid it all. And that's what you are trying to get the the non-Christian to understand. As I finish, God's condition of salvation is justification before God is conditioned on faith alone. We understand that. The other thing I have said is that faith is to believe, to trust, to place your confidence in, reliance on God for eternal destiny. And then you are keeping your, your future into God's safekeeping because you believe he is able. Like it says in Genesis 15, believe in the Lord uh, and it was reckoned as righteousness for, for Abraham. Romans 4, 3. And of course, Romans 3, 22, 27, 28, um, Martin Luther, the reformer, discovered we are justified by faith. It's not something you do, it's by grace. Once you, what you are required is to trust in God. John's Gospel says this same thing 99 times. Over 150 times in the whole Bible. John 20, that, that one written that you may believe. The Bible is written. And you need to help the, the non-Christian to understand that. But by believing, you have eternal life. Isn't that what we say when we are talking about in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that those who believe, those who put their trust in him, have hope. And that's all the non-Christian needs to do. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes has eternal life and has passed from faith, from death to life. If you put your trust, you hear my word first, which is the work of every witness, you must go and share the word. Once he puts his trust in what God has said, he is forgiven. John 6, 28, 29, what must we do to, be, uh, to do the works of God? Put our trust in him. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I tell you, he who believes has eternal life. May the Lord truly help us to understand that. And that is, you can help every non-Christian to read it. Romans 10.10. 10. I normally call it Formula 10.10 10, Formula 10, 10 because it really summarizes all I have been talking about salvation. Romans 10.10. 10. You believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth, then you are saved. You need the non-Christian to understand he must believe about his sinfulness, and the atonement that Christ has achieved. But he must also be willing to confess openly with his mouth that from now onwards he has put his trust in God, that Jesus is now the Lord of his life. 
That combination summarizes all you need to do to be born again.